So you guys writing three now? That's where you're at? We are. Yep. Although it's kind of somewhat. I'm just gonna grab my coffee. We're not we're not really allowed to talk about it because it hasn't been officially greenlit. Oh yeah, yeah. I noticed that. I read an interview, and the response to like that question was very diplomatic. <laughs> and so yeah, everyone everyone bugs us about like not saying really what's going on. But that's the first question you get, right? Like, yeah, question. like what's going on, and yeah. and it's hard to answer because people don't want us to Nothing. say that we're right. No, we're not doing anything. My favorite were the interviews I read that happened between one and two, and people were, like talking about Helena and being like, "It sucks that you." What happened? You guys were like, "Yeah, I know it was a really hard decision." <laughs> you must have been like, "This is ridiculous." Well, it was funny. So tired of yeah. mine. <laughs> it was funny though because we got hit with that question. I remember getting hit with that question first at Comic Con when we went oh, last yeah, yeah. year. And we hadn't really, no one had asked us, no one had interviewed us, not, and it was suddenly going, uh, like, it's like getting caught, like getting caught and then having to lie, like, right in the moment. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, everyone's done that. It, everyone's done that, and no. suddenly, and then, you know, the more you lie, the better you get, at it, <laughs> of course. Well, you guys said that con movies were kind of an influence sometimes. Like, it seems like the show goes into, like, con movie mode a bit, like. Sarah does, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, at the beginning, uh, you know, we were interested in in con stuff, like especially short con, like and just the quick, quick grifter mm. stuff, not the big long con, not the sting. <laughs> Maybe we'll do the sting in season three. But that's kind of what Sarah was, right? That's kind of how we developed that character. Is she? Yeah. That's she was a she was kind of like a lived on the street and you know ripped people off and. Ragamuffin. Yep. Well, that's a, a good transition question because it, uh, the thing that interests me the most is finding out that it was a film idea initially. And I'm, I'm curious, nuts and bolts, uh, the nuts and bolts aspect of it, what changed when it became a TV show? What were the pros and cons that you came up or faced up against when it transitioned from something that's like a self contained narrative that's this long to who knows? Is there going to be three seasons, four seasons? You never really know. Well, we never could contain it in a feature. No. Um, I mean, we could never wrap it up satisfactorily. I don't think we ever ever finished a feature film script. No, we never finished a feature film script. I don't know if we... We did a lot of... <coughs> we did a lot of outlining. We did a lot of, like... Uh, we wrote, uh, you know, had a lot of uh, scene flow. Um, a lot of tons of ideas and uh, yeah. just every time we would get around to sort of discussing how what the third act was going to look like and how we were going to answer it um, every single time it, we just we just couldn't find a satisfactory answer and and it was just we were really good at setting it up and 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 just but just every 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 time every single answer just seemed like it was you know so in that sense like the decision to um, put it in a TV format, especially cable format, was was like the thing that broke through for us. Then uh, you know, then it could be all set up. He's great at set up. Well, we were both <laughs> really good at set up. We really loved the mystery, right? Every any time it was that like it was about the mystery and it was about following clues and it was about making these little mini discoveries and and uh, that's kind of really what the show is. Um, <clears throat> the big answer though is, is a tricky one because you know you, you set up a lot of expectation and um, uh, I just think in, you know it just didn't seem like the answers just didn't seem satisfactory in, in a future film format. So in a television format what's nice is we can kind of set up tons of mystery and give answers all, all, all along the way and I think that that's what that's what is kind of exciting for the audience is that there's there's t lots of questions and lots of mystery but there's a, there's lots of answers there's lots of filling in the mm -hmm. blanks and and discoveries for the audience to make as the, as they go along yeah you can give you can give episodic answers and you can give season answers and then you can save the series answers the big series questions that we set up you can we can save and spin those out is that how you've kind of dealt with the challenge that all of these types of shows face, which is how do you keep them going when they're a success, but also 
make the fans feel like you have a conclusion planned and it's not just like, you know. It's all for naught. Yeah, I mean, I don't <laughs> want to mention the show that gets beat up on so much with all of these. Like, I loved that show. Yeah, I, I, I love that too. show. <laughs> I love that show. You don't even need to name it, but like, we're all aware that there was definitely a season where it felt like they were kind of trying to transition between keeping this going or maybe not, because you also don't know if something's going to get greenlit. Yeah, well, we, I mean, we, we've had an end game in mind. And that end game, you know, through now coming into three seasons, uh, it's modified, but it hasn't changed. So we've able, been able to push it down the road um, a, little, a little further each season and um, still manage to, to uh, put a good shape to a season mm -hmm. um, and, and save the big reveal for, uh, you know, for the for for the culmination of of the of the show, not just the season. I think I think we we we're, we're, we know what our last the the show's final three episodes. Frame? Do you know what the final frame is? I don't know what the final frame is. What song are you gonna have playing? <laughs> the new one. Hmm. Hmm. The Orphan Black theme song. <laughs> cheap Trick. Yeah. Okay. I think it should be Cheap Trick. Well, I like what was it the Trogs. Uh, yeah, we the one yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but what about you? You said like uh, kind of pacing out a season. How do you do that? Because you guys describe it as like a, a steamroller. Like it, it seems like speed is something that you're you're using to describe how you pace out a season. But I mean, now we have TV reviews per episode, and like people kind of treat them as chunks that they're watching in and of themselves. But then you have an audience that's watching them all binge. Like how do you? pace out a single season. They're like chapters, really, aren't mm -hmm. they? Yeah. I mean, we just think of it as a chapter. Each, each, each episode is like a chapter. And we, we have the advantage of, <clears throat> to some degree, making 10 episodes, even though it makes some audience members crazy, only doing 10 episodes and making them 43 minutes long allows us to cram material together, right? And, and allows us to keep up this relentless pace. If we were making 22 episodes and or or making them at a you know at the length that a you know HBO makes their their shows at like an hour, there's we I don't know that the show would be able to maintain the pace and the and the energy that it that we currently have. We wouldn't have time to write it, mm. basically. No. Mm -hmm. We would Not to the detail that we have to write it to do that pace. But we would we'd be forced to slow down. Yeah. And and th what's nice about our format right now is it's just. It's it's super energized. So you don't feel compelled yet to have a bottle episode or that one that everyone's like, well, this one nothing really happened. Whenever we whenever we say we're going to have a bottle episode, it ends up being three Tatiana's, and it's not a bottle <laughs> episode anymore because it takes so long. And yeah, yeah. I mean it's funny because we in season one we our bottle episode was episode six. Episode six. The upstairs downstairs, which. Was fine. We shot it faster, but it, it's turned out to be super complex, right? And this season, I think episode eight was our bottle episode. You know, we do think of that. We do try and create an episode per season where we try and contain it a little bit more and and try and um, you know, you, I, I think shows do that to kind of um, uh, save dough, save dough, save money, right? So that they can. Put it all into their fantastic season finale. Yeah, <laughs> this seven-year weird episode. Like, if you could call it that one, that one seemed like everything was off slightly, like in a fun way. But like, just like everyone was behaving. It, it, like, there's always weird elements, but it seemed like they all kind of there was a confluence of them in episode seven. Was it the weird episode? Well, it was weird in the extent of the the highs and the lows. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It, it, The mix of like kind of. Absurd humor, exactly mixed right. with like heavy dramatic scenes. Aubrey right? Nealon wrote it. He's weird. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 th I think that one of the things that we love about the show is the fact that we can kind of uh, mash up genres, right? And we can go. Yeah. We can kind of have a kind of strong comedic storyline on the one hand, and then a very serious dramatic storyline uh, uh, running simultaneously. Mm and be able to bounce back and forth between both. And I think it works pretty well. I think, uh, I enjoy it anyway, I like seeing that. Yeah, people really are expecting it now. And, um, for us, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the freedom. We get to make like three or four shows in one. 
um, and still be pumpy, pulpy, mm. pulpy fun. Pulpy fun. Does that change how it looks? I mean, I've been trying to, I went back and rewatched season one, I was trying to see if the look of the show kind of changed, and it seemed like maybe in the first few episodes it kind of had like that, like under cranking, over cranking thing, but then it kind of settled into a, a static kind of style, but you're working with different directors and, um, but the color palette too is also pretty consistent. So I'm, I'm curious how you have a, a, a look that accommodates all of, the, all of these genres, but is also consistent for a TV show. That, I mean, the, the idea of separate worlds for us was really big. Just, in ter just thematically and in terms of writing it and thinking about those worlds, we knew really early that Alice and Cosima and Sarah's world could be very visually different, um, uh, distinct palettes. Yeah. We talked a lot about that. Um, and just, uh, just each world to carry its own tone. And then we have an absolutely fantastic DOP, Aaron Morton. Yeah. I think the, the idea of being, just and also from a production design point of view in season one, Ian Brock, our production designer, I mean, that was, it was very, very much about the feel of all these different environments. The world was very different for each of these characters and Graham spoke to theme and that, that is nature versus nurture, right? It's all of these girls are very, very individual and very different from each other. So it was really important to us that that those environments uh, were, you know, reflected that, reflected their differences. Um, and then, you know, I don't know, from a, from a style point of view, I think in, in the early beginnings, um, you know, I think to some degree you're, you're, you're trying to discover what your style is. So it's a little bit, you're experimenting with things, you know, we didn't, we didn't, hadn't made a clone show before, so there was a lot of like trial and error. And <clears throat> I think the show is kind of settled into a nice place. Like it, my goal for the show is always to keep it uh, very cinematic and, um, and not let it fall into sort of typical a typical sort of TV look. It, uh, you know, I want it to have its own look and feel and style that is kind of unique to the show. So th that's something that we always sort of strive for is to, is to try and kind of make the show look bigger and, you know, than maybe our, our meager budgets uh, uh, su uh, uh, <laughs> suggest. <laughs> Well, it just seems that the coloring especially is so distinct in it. Not even just like what you're filming, but just like how it's being colored in post. Uh, yeah. kind of, maybe it's the new locations, but like there's like a pastoral quality to it. Or We opened up the world, especially at the beginning of season two. That was very purposeful. Something yeah. that John really wanted to do. Take it out, out, of the, out of the city. Get out of the city, out of that gritty urban environment that was a kind of a signature look for the first season. Um, take it on the road and, and open it up and give it that extra cinematic kind of boost. Yeah. And then the weather turns crappy here, of course, so we got to bring it back inside later <laughs> in the season. And then you wind up back, yeah. I mean, that's just what you have to do shooting in the Canadian winter. But, um, but <clears throat> also, uh, I can't say enough about our cinematographer, Aaron Morton. He's a, a New Zealand cinematographer and um, just an, an amazing collaborator extremely visual and um, just um, uh, uh, he is really like uh, you know uh, we collaborated together uh, early on on the look of the show but he really like the look is so much air um, the look of the, the of the pictures is so much air you know we collaborate him and I collaborate on on um, on the shots and the camera uh, placement but you know, he's he's really in charge of the look of the of the series. He's the one that does all that fluorescence with daylight. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Lots and lots of practicals. Yeah. Do, does each director have a different way of dealing with similar scenes? I know I was reading an interview where you're talking about your first time working with a three clone scene versus someone else. Like, mm -hmm. is there twists that you guys notice happening visually? I early on in season one, obviously, I came in and directed the first two. Um, and then, you know, other directors come in and they see what's been done and they kind of get a sense of the look of the show and, and we keep our director pool small. Uh, so we're working with the same guys a lot. Uh, uh, and, um, 
They get competitive, the directors. Mm -hmm. yeah. They try and one-up themselves or each other. Well, when you're doing that stuff, it is really about like what haven't we done, and what has they, what did this guy do, and what can I do better? And you know, it is. It gets a little competitive amongst the directors, and I think that's healthy. <laughs> Does that happen in the writing room? Uh, not really. Are you trying to challenge the directors, trying to like make it as? <laughs> oh, you're trying to give them the weirdest stuff possible. <laughs> well, uh, always trying to push the room towards uh, visual storytelling. I mean, you know, like as much as possible, like trying to create visual elements for the directors to sort of sink their teeth into, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And is the, like, the, the weird stuff you're mentioning or the or, or crazy stuff, is that like the kind of lineage of body horror? Or maybe, like, I mean, there's also an X-Files thing, but then we're also seeing like Hannibal becoming so popular now, so it seems like it's something that you're getting away with a little bit more, like you can have crazier stuff. Yeah, it's not crazy for a crazy sake. Yeah, um, we like to really tie it in tightly to theme and story and have it make sense. But it's nice to be in a cable environment where you can go for it and you can add those layers that that um, take the scene to a to a weird place or or take the scene off, mm -hmm. add another unexpected um, off kilter dimension to it. We push each other to do that in the writer's room. We look at scenes and say, how do we, how do we twist this scene? You know, it's, it's a good scene, it's doing what it is, but what, where's the orphan black in it? Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? We like to make bold choices and, and, um, and make choices that people aren't necessarily going to expect. I mean, that's just kind of the way we roll. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you seem comfortable being so specific with, especially with some of the science stuff, uh, but the location is so, deliberately vague, which I, like, I always find interesting, but especially in, I think it was the eighth episode, maybe ninth of, of this season, uh, where Mark uh, has, like, the, there's the, like, army background and, like, fighting for your nation, and it's like, now it's, like, actually coming into the, the dialogue, but you still don't really fully know what nation they're in. Is that something you're going to continue to play with, or is it something that eventually you're going to have to just, like, pin down, or can you never do that because of the, the different companies involved? Well, that's, that's where it started. It starts with, you know, international co-production and everybody needing uh, um, certain things out of the show to, for their own markets. So, yeah, we, you know, it's not, our, it's not our favorite, wasn't our favorite place to be in Netherland. But um, it's something we got really used to and now it's sort of, we, we like it because the show sort of exists in its own world, you know. It's and it has that slightly international flavor and borderless flavor. Um, you know, maybe it feels a little helps it uh, you know, give it that science fiction borderless flavor. I think I think to that part of it was <clears throat> people have relaxed a little bit now, right? It's yeah. Uh, you know, now that the show is kind of out there People know what it is. They know it's a Canadian mm -hmm. show. Um, it, I think people have kind of relaxed a little bit, but um, seems like most things you read now they identify the location as Toronto. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always been interesting that there are specific references that if you're in Toronto you get, but I also know that if you're not, you're not going to know what like Parkdale is or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you should eventually use Robarts as like a space jail kind of like in sliders. <laughs> That location somehow being some brutalist like. All right. <laughs> That's my one request. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks, guys. All right. What's the which what place is Roberts? Uh, the Roberts. building and it's the library on U of T. Oh, I, well, I want to use that one. one that shaped like it's a all the peacock. cubist one. It's the just, peacock. Yeah, it's I, thought it was, I thought it was a loon. Oh, a loon I thought it was supposed to be a loon. I thought it was some Canadian. <laughs> That, I don't know, that's what I'm I go by it every day. I never even saw it was a bird. You didn't see. You knew it was a bird. No, no. It's just oh. a big it's it's a stack, stack of shaped like a bird. If yeah. you look from like, uh, you, what is it, Hoskin? You have to look uh, west. Yeah, west. The oh. rare book library is like the head. It like it actually does you, jet up. Oh. If you're on Harvard, looking yeah. west towards it, that's where you kind. Of, is it on or is it on Hoskin? Well, just, Harvard turns into Hoskin. Oh, right? it yeah, doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Is it the? Is it the one? It's the one at Spadina with the thing hanging over the road, or the no, one? No, no. The, yeah, it's a uh, Saint George. And right. Yeah. Harbor, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. But yeah, sliders famously used. Okay, when I ride my bike past there next time, I'll check it out. A, a dictatorship, like jail, like that. And I think there's a movie where it's like a, in the 70s where it's a spaceship or something. I think it's really well, we did, ridiculous. Because you do use U of T, right? We it's shot up we, when, when uh, in season one, when Kasima was on, uh, uh, when she was at the University of, of Minnesota, yeah. we used U of T. Um, we used a bunch of campus buildings there and you know had some had a bunch of exteriors that we shot like there was a little piece with Cosima and Delphine after they steal wine from the running through the quad running through the quad and uh, Leakey's TED talk is at the university and and of the library where uh, Cosima first kind of meets Delphine really oh well, not first meets her but where they get together and right yeah that, that whole episode was I did a day or a day and a half at UT campus there shooting it's fun watching and just being like where where is that that looks familiar yeah cool thanks so much thank All you right.